Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the event. So as you can probably tell by my voice, I am a first generation immigrant. So I was very, very happy to be invited to this tonight. Not only because this is my field of expertise, but because this is my story too. And I'm sure this will be some of your stories as well. So I'll be charged tonight and give you a little bit of background on theories about immigration and what's wrong with you. You can't hear me? Uh, all right. Like this? Is that <laughs> all right. Round two. <laughs> so, I'm in charge tonight to give you a little bit of background on the theories of immigration and this idea of assimilation. Anyone heard of that term before? Yeah. It's like the idea of becoming like someone, becoming like a new culture, a new country, that kind of thing. So, in my field of sociology, there's really been three major theories that explain how immigrants like me, my British self, maybe become American and what those processes are. So the first one is really quite simple. This is the idea of assimilation being like a straight line, like that. That every day, every month, every year, every decade that passes that an immigrant is in a country, they become more and more like that, that host, yeah? That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? that I would be more American now, even though maybe you can't hear it, than I was 15 years ago when I arrived. That I've learned about culture, I've learned about language, that these are pants and not trousers. <laughs> and uh, they're cookies and not biscuits. And that uh, how are they? That's not mean, oh I'm very well, thank you, but it's it made me today. And oh my mum isn't very well. How are you means Oh, I'm fine. How are you? That kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> so then we about this kind of stuff. It's a problem, isn't it? And the simulation is like that. So the straight line theory just says basically, the longer you are here, the more like a culture you'll become. Now the end point of this, this straight line is at some point, I will be a barrier. Woo! And I just took my citizenship test two weeks ago. I'm almost there. <laughs> but anyway, this theory contends that at some point we all become quite alike, don't we? But we all become American, whatever that might mean. Now, the importance of this theory is works on the surface, but is my journey really a straight line? Probably not. There are days I wake up and I feel very British. Things like November 5th, where it's Guy Fawkes Night in England, and I desperately want to set off fireworks that want to be arrested. Things like that. There are days, World Cup, for example, when England wins the World Cup. I don't get any more British than that. I feel really tied to my home. But there's other days where I feel really American. And so I think my straight line is a bit zigzaggy. It's not that straight line that perhaps they think. And I also think it's a bit strange that I would become American. I mean, what does that really mean? What does that mean to you? Is there one type of person in America? Is there one type of culture? Probably not. So this theory has been criticized for being a bit too simplistic and a bit, a bit limited in terms of what we can really explain. So the next theory to come along after that is the theory of why we're here tonight. The idea of a melting pot. That sounds grand, doesn't it? Melting pot. Sounds so romantic and idealistic that we would all blend together. So let me see. Do we have any immigrants, first generations like me in here? Okay. Where are we from? The Philippines. The Philippines. Where else have we gone? Scotland. Scotland. Ah! It's not that old. I speak it. Anywhere else? Yes. Are you from Rome? Very good. Is that anyone else? India. India. Who else? Who else we have? Spain. Spain. Anyone else? At the back there. The Netherlands. Wow. So we have a very, very international crowd here of these immigrants. Now the melting pot, look at all these different people. And they would think about contributing a bit of their culture to the pot. So whoever that is. Uh, it sounds like, oh, I'm going to guess at what we might contribute. So Scotland, okay. 
I love your culture, and I love I love how it moves so much as you grow up. So maybe that can come into the pot. And then let's see, Philippines. I love the multicultural nature of the Philippines and how mixed and diverse and how open the people they are. Maybe that can come in. I mean, from England, well, I don't know what we've been certain amount of food. So <laughs> we go, all of this will go into the pot, yeah? And we take all the best bits from people's culture and it will be blended. And so eventually, the idea with the melting pot is that everyone will kind of come out the same. That all the good bits will come in and we'll take those little good bits. And the idea is it's kind of like a soup. Imagine blending a soup. Putting all those different flavors in. If you use one of those blenders for long enough, every mouthful is going to be the same, isn't it? Every mouthful that you take up will be the same. So the melting pot kind of bases itself on the idea that, again, the end point is, is that we are all the same. There's one taste of America. Now, do you think that that's what life is like in America? Not really. Do we all have equal access to get into the pot? Maybe not. Also, isn't it possible that we could all be different flavors and that the flavors would be individual and we need to taste it? Possibly. So again, this theory has been criticized because basically the idea is, is that we all pick out the same. So the people who are theorizing this base their ideas really on European and the rest of the 19th century. The English, the Dutch, the Germans, so on and so forth. And they did blend together pretty well. They were very similar in some respects. They were all quite wealthy. They all had the same religion. It made it quite easy for them to blend together. So you can imagine when they had this theory, you know, think about those people and make a lot of sense. But that's not what the immigration is really like now, is it? We're not all the same base flavor, we're all different types of flavors. So that brings us to our third and last theory I want to tell you a little bit about that. So apparently sociologists really like food metaphors. So we have the melting pot, but the other one is the salad bowl. The salad bowl, or what we call pluralism. Now the salad bowl, instead of all those flavors going in and being mixed together, so every mouthful was the same. It's kind of like the idea of a salad. That you've got individual bits in there, all taste kind of good. So if you wanted to, you could pick out the bits in the salad that you like. Maybe you are a tomato man, or should I say tomato? Maybe you have tomatoes, and just pick those out. Enjoy the flavor of tomato. Or maybe you're an olive fan, you pick those out. And you can taste each bit individually. Like the cultures in America, with each individual flavor. Or you do what I do, which is take a huge mouthful, shove it in your mouth, and chew it all together so it kind of blends together. You could do that too, couldn't you? So this idea of pluralism is kind of a newer step in terms of the theory. The idea that perhaps we could have different flavors, different people, different cultures, side by side. And that you could have individual flavors. Individual cultures under this big hole, this big umbrella of America. So that's kind of the direction the theory is moving. That said, there's still a few problems with this. <coughs> because in order for a big salad bowl to happen, everyone has to be comfortable with being next to someone who's a bit different than them, don't they? As a tomato, you have to be happy living next to an olive. And so the food metaphors continue. So this is this is also an area that people are trying to work out and trying to kind of make sense of in a really modern America right now. So, everyone think they know a little bit more? Excellent. All right, so, with that in mind, and some of the ideas of what we just talked about, what I'd like to do now is turn over to our panelists. We all have individual stories about this experience, and I would like their takes on this idea, and particularly the idea of the melting pot. Because the melting pot is really one of these long-lasting ideas that stick around with us in America. But we really think, we used to tell all the time, ah, oh, the great melting pot, but what are we really involving? So I'd like to introduce our first panel member. Uh, <coughs> so our first panel member tonight is Pedro Rodriguez. He's the director of the Office of Human Resources for the City of Philadelphia. 
Mrs Rodriguez was appointed director in May 2016 by the Civil Service Commission in Philadelphia. Prior to this appointment, he served a full six-year term in the commission as commissioner. Mr. Rodriguez is a seasoned community organizer who has led several organizations in the Philadelphia area, including Director of Open Borders Project, a Huntington Valley Old New Bar-based organization providing community programs such as English classes, computer courses, and after-school programs. So I'd like to welcome Mr. Rodriguez now. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks for the uh, society for sponsoring this really, really interesting uh, kind of discussion and conversation. Very timely, given the political situation out in the country today. And I want to reflect both of my own personal immigrant experience in the United States, in Philadelphia, and the experience of the community I come from. I was born in the Dominican Republic. Uh, and I followed my parents' migration to New York, which is the traditional Dominican route to the United States. As a matter of fact, New York City is the second largest Dominican city in the world, second only to the capital of Santo Domingo. There are a million Dominicans residing in New York City. Well, about five million in Santo Domingo, nine million down in the country. When I left over here, there were about four million people in our country. Uh, my first few years in the United States, you know, I finished high school in New York. And my first few years were spent unconsciously deconstructing the myth about America. <laughs> Unfortunately for me, I had a good awakening because when I lived in the Dominican Republic, we were told that in New York you can find money in the streets. <laughs> <laughs> my second day in New York, I found Capital sentence. So I said, oh my god, this is true. <laughs> <laughs> Everything I thought about the United States is wrong. I had to reconsider that. Uh, but as time went on, being able to integrate myself into the new society, learning its roles, understanding its people, it took me the better part of 15 years. Is that easy? It is an experience that I recommend to new immigrants to try to understand the United States. You can find your place within it. If you can never understand where you are, you're going to have a rough time. You're probably going to live, you know, exist in a negotiation, and you're going to run into many difficulties in your life. If you start a family, you want to transfer most of your life to the family. Where we are moving forward, I came in 1972, I'm the oldest of a family of six. Uh, all of us were born in the Dominican Republic, except for the youngest one who was born in New York. Uh, but at this point in our lives, we pretty much consider ourselves Americans and Dominicans apart. Can I give an example? It just happened last week. Thanksgiving in our house now. If we were to among the only siblings, we do the turkey, which is a late cover to our dinner. <laughs> and we do the roast pork. Because that's, if the wedding is get together anywhere, roast pork has to be part And, but the food is only one indication of how far we see ourselves. Well, the conversation on the table this year was all about politics in the outcome of the presidential elections. And that has forced many of my siblings and nephews and nieces to kind of step back and say, look, we have a very precarious existence in the United States to be in a sector who we are. And there's a tendency to move to a reaffirming their own national identity, to understand that unless you are firmly grounded on who you are as an individual. You might be subject to the ups and downs of political discourse in the United States. Anti-immigrant feeling and xenophobia that creeps in every 30 or 40 years in our history in this country. Mm -hmm. Aside from many other 
groups that come to the United States, people from Latin America, particularly from the Caribbean, have a very unique experience of coming to the United States. Uh, Fidel Castro used to say that the Americans form themselves a very special kind of people. As if you know in history, many Dominicans followed Fidel Castro during the 50s in Cuba to achieve the victory of the Cuban Revolution. <coughs> and one of the Cuba's first international mistakes was to be convinced by the Dominicans who were there to invade the Dominican Republic to try to topple the dictator figure, which they did, and they failed, and grant repercussions for Cuba as a nation internationally. But the Americans keep saying, we are very special kind of people. And people say, well, why? They start playing baseball. <laughs> uh, well, we were in Baylor in the United States twice in the same century. One in 1916 and one in 1965. I used to know a guy who fought both times against the U.S. invasion. And the Americans who came to the United States came with that consciousness of rebelliousness which it was good in one sense, but it's really all from the other sense because it prevented them from fully integrating themselves and understanding the society that they live in and work in and were basically families. It's only the second generation that's begun to see themselves paying more attention to the goings and happenings in their own communities and to begin to participate fully and actively as full Americans into that society that has allowed that to happen. But why the government remains the strong relationship both economically and socially between the two countries? 50% of the, the, uh, the national domestic product of the Dominican Republic comes from remittances that are relatively sent back to the Dominican Republic. A friend of mine who served in the Peace Corps in the Dominican Republic you know, was complaining that when a fashion happens in New York City before it gets to Chicago, it's in San Domingo already used up. Uh, so the level of connection and connectivity that I see between the two countries is difficult to break, which also makes it really difficult for people to try to become fully integrated to the U.S. society. But having said that, I believe that history and events kind of force immigrants to choose a path of how they're going to see their own identity, how they're going to see their own communities. And we are living in one of those moments right now. Uh, because it is now clear that your attempts to really be part of the melting pot, to really put in your two cents, <coughs> to put in your food, your music, your cultural uh, heritage, to be shared by everybody else, there's a huge segment of the population that say who doesn't appreciate that, who don't want that, who reject probably our right to protect that. And who wants to go down even further than that, it is to limit your rights, regardless of whether or not you were born in this country and you are the the sons and daughters of immigrants, or if you are a nationalized citizen. The fact that the president elect is tweeting that if you do X, you can take away your citizenship. To native born individuals, it might be how that residents who people are naturalized, who people are in the process of becoming permanent residents and being part of society. Immigration has to be understood within the context of global politics today. And whether or not the immigration experience is one that you chose because you wanted to or you were forced to do, and you went to the only place that you believed was a safe place for you to be at and work and produce and start a family <coughs> and retire in, all of that is coming down with recent events. That is not to say that we don't have strong organizational capacity to persist, to create alliances with people, because that has been demonstrated throughout the past 
and even the recent past, that we lack capacity to do. Dominicans are now beginning to feel like look, we have a responsibility to join in the fight, not only to protect our own rights and our own existence and our own identity within this country, but also to help others succeed and, 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 and beat back this type of regressivism that we're experiencing right now. In Philadelphia, we're fortunate enough that we have you know, policies that are welcoming to immigrants right now. And this, for those immigrants who live in the city of Philadelphia, as you put it, this is a great opportunity for you, for us to demonstrate to the larger population how capable and able we are to contribute to the well-being of the entire city and region. It's not a time for us to step back and receive into our own communities and our own life and do our own things independent of that or anybody else, because that's not going to work. The fact that you can take North Fifth Street from the right Avenue and go north, and you can experience 20 different cuisines from around the world, is a wonderful thing that should be, uh, it should be exalted, it should be celebrated, and it should be promoted and enjoyed, not only by the city as a whole, but immigrants in particular. Because by showing just the food, you can also begin to show and demonstrate your own capacity and ability to, to help the country move forward. This conversation is a conversation I think that should happen more frequently than many other places. Because a lot of the rejection that we saw in the election to people that look like me had to do more with ignorance and misperceptions. And I find myself and I fault myself. Because perhaps I have not done enough to aim about this. And I have not done enough to be around people who don't look like me, who know something like me, so they can appreciate me and my community for who, who it's really not. And just to mess up about who I am and who I thought I was, about two weeks ago, I finally received my ancestry DNA. <laughs> I was given as a different name and I found my name recently, so I got the results. So, everything I know about myself is wrong. 48% European, 42% African, 9% Native American. The Native American part was really striking because I was taught in school in the Dominican Republic by popular culture, by historians and scientists, that any trace of native populations in the islands of the Antilles have been wiped out by the Spaniards. But apparently that's not the case. There's still trace to the DNA that we carry out to today. And that's something that I encourage more Dominicans to do the same, because we could find similar percentages of DNA of our native population, because that will change further now how we perceive ourselves. And 10% from Mali, 8% from uh, Nigeria, 12% Irish.
is Ron Fayez, who is a journalist who is living and working in West Philadelphia, covering entrepreneurship, tech, and dining. So the Arabian by birth, but Virginian by upbringing, who are um, Fayez's undergraduate studies at Virginia Tech, go focus, and graduate studies at SUNY Albany. She has found meaning in intercultural and cultural communication. Uh, theory has a way to validate her experiences. Fayez is a young diplomat at that, so young diplomat at Citizen Diplomacy International and a member of the National Association of Multi Ethnicity Communication. So thank you for joining us and we would love to hear your views on the melting pot. Also hear a little bit about your story too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know if my uh, talk will have as many Facts. We'll be back on as many uh, historical facts, um, but I'll, I'll do my best. It's a, it's a tough act to follow. <laughs> and I'll uh, just hold the uh, microphone up. Like this? So, yeah, closer to your mouth. Is the like, best. like this? Like your better? Well, I just wanted to kind of uh, go into the story of, of how um, I arrived here. Um, I'm also a first generation. Um, I was I was 12. Um, I moved from, from Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, which is one of the biggest cities um, in Saudi Arabia. And um, I moved to Blacksburg, Virginia, a little town in southwest Virginia where Virginia Tech is. Um, it was a huge culture shock. Um, the mall was uh, one floor. Um, and um, if you're familiar with, with what uh, Jeddah is like, it's, it's where the entire country goes to shop. It's kind of a beach of bar that's where the, you know, uh, that's where a lot of entertainment is. Um, and uh, moved to a little sleepy town, college town, um, where, you know, I saw cows on the way to school. Um, it, was, it, was, it was a strange experience because, um, it, it's not what I had imagined. Um, and I, I did have the chance to travel to the United States when I was younger, um, to bigger cities, but um, I just thought the entire country had, uh, like, uh, you know, big shopping malls and, uh, you know, big restaurants and things like that. Um, but, you know, I very quickly realized that it's not, it's not the case at all. Um, so, uh, for you know, a little girl who's about to be a teenager, um, I of course I thought about shopping. I thought about uh, you know doing all the things that teenagers like to do. Um, but uh, I guess I, I remember one experience that stands out. Um, I tend to like to ask people questions. I mean that's what I do for a living, right? I'm a reporter. Um, I like I like to ask questions. I like to understand where people come from. Um, and as a result, um, as a teenager, um, I was school bus <coughs> one day, you know, uh, during, during an election. And um, I was asking a lot of questions, giving a lot of opinions, um, just, just discussing um, the election with my schoolmates. And I remember um, a kid that was on my bus saw me later that day when I was getting on the bus to go back. I was, it was really early to the bus because I had a fear of being left behind. Uh, uh, <laughs> So I, I sat on the school bus, and he uh, had this question for me that made me really uncomfortable. He said, why do you think you get to have opinions about our country? <coughs> um, and, and that experience really stood out, because um, since then, throughout high school, um, and after that, I, I decided that maybe, maybe politics didn't really belong to me in this country. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm not allowed to participate. Um, but still maintain my opinions, just, just kind of kept them mostly to myself. Um, until more recently, I've never really been a, a political person, but to be honest, more recently I've, I've felt um, less safe. I've decided to, uh, to speak out. Um, I think we all need to speak out if we feel uncomfortable. Um, that's, I think that's the difference between melting pot and a kaleidoscope. The melting pot or a salad bowl uh, to keep the food keep going. Uh, the melting pot, I feel like uh, there is a tendency to become very homogenous. Um, salad bowl, kaleidoscope, um, you get to all um, 
I hate to use this word, but kind of coexist. Um, so that's, that's kind of my view on these things. Um, so, so that experience kind of really stood out, and I still, I still hold it till this day as a way to explain um, how certain voices tend to become muted. Right? Um, so during my studies as an undergraduate, I studied um, you know, a couple of theories, two of them really stood out, um, especially in, in communication. Um, one is muted group theory, where you actually effectively kind of shut down someone's ability to say something, or their, their kind of efficacy, self-efficacy to speak out um, by making them feel uncomfortable. Um, another one is co-cultural theory, um, co-cultural communication theory, where um, people tend to deal with differences in culture in kind of three different ways, right? So there is one way where you block it out completely because you just don't want to deal with it. Um, there's another way where you can find a bridge to kind of mix things together, or uh, another way is to just completely, completely assimilate and homogenize. Um, that's kind of been the way I've been perceiving um, communicating um, about my experiences. Um, I used to not want to talk about them at all. I felt really uncomfortable um, because it's tough to navigate which space, space is safe and which space is not. Um, I've been worried about maybe being, being targeted. Um, but as I grew older and I had a um, better understanding of how these things work, I decided to um, why not explore bridging things, you know? Um, and the reason I came across co culture communication is because um, as an undergraduate, I was actually doing um, a research project on um, ethnic identity and punk rock. Um, I like punk rock a lot as a kid. That was, uh, for some reason, was the genre I really liked when um, I moved to Virginia, Southwest Virginia. Um, and uh, I, I just kind of uh, saw myself in it because it was, it was kind of a maybe a subculture. Um, it felt like I was a part of a subculture. I, I, saw, um, <coughs> I saw a lot of similarities. Um, and the way of cultural communication theory works is that you kind of have a choice of what identity you want to um, you don't have an identity forced upon you, you kind of have an identity that you identify with, that you're comfortable with, um, and it doesn't have to be the one that you were born into. Um, it can be a mixture of, of different identities. It can be a multifaceted kaleidoscope as opposed to a melting pot. Um, and that's kind of how I define my experience.
we've had mass immigration since the 1990s, and I think now it's about 20% of uh, people living in Ireland are foreign born. So that's a huge change in, in a very, very short space of time. And so 10 years ago, I started my journey just with a sense of adventure. I wasn't brought here as a child. I wasn't, you know, an economic migrant or anything. I literally came because I wanted to have an experience, and that started in Australia. In Australia, I then met my husband, who is Brazilian, and after a few years, we moved to Brazil. And I experienced a completely different culture there, where not only had I got to sort of um, assimilate to some degree, I also had to learn a new language, which adds an, an extra level of complexity, which, which you probably know. Um, it, it, it's a whole different ball game compared to moving from the UK to the United States or moving from the United States to Australia. And then uh, in 2014, I won the Green Card Lottery. I've been playing it for 13 years. <laughs> I was one of the lucky 0.01% of people that won it. And so, you know, after 13 years of trying, my, my dream came true. And I, and I got to move to the United States, which was really exciting. And so that brought me to where I am today, and I, I work at the Irish Immigration Centre, and we, we basically service the Irish community. So I, I can talk a little bit about them and their history here. I believe that over a million um, people in Pennsylvania have some kind of Irish descent. So that, that's a huge population um, uh, within the state. And a lot of people will be many generations down the line, and we deal predominantly with the more people of Irish descent. So either they're Irish, their parents um, were Irish, immediate sort of connection. And what's interesting about our center is that the demographics are actually quite old. So the average age for an Irish born um, person uh, living in America is actually 60 years of age. And um, if you compare Irish people immigrating today, um, for every three people that immigrate to Australia, one immigrates to the United States. And, and why, may you ask? And um, it's funny, because when I lived in Brazil, I, I used to work with a lot of Brazilians to prepare them for moving overseas from professional classes. A lot of them moved to Canada and Australia, and why? Because it's, it's easier to get a visa for there. So a lot of the Irish people of today are, are very educated. So when you're educated, you're not going to throw away years of education um, to live somewhere undocumented. Um, you're going to go somewhere where you have access to a visa, where you can practice your profession, and uh, where you can improve, improve your life, right? And so hence why a lot of young Irish people today choose Canada and Australia because there are clear paths and they have certain bonus point systems where you can move over. And the, the Irish people, the young ones that tend to move here today have some sort of link or connection uh, to Philadelphia. That a lot of them would have family connections here. It would be uncles, aunties, uh, friends, neighbors. We often see villages in this particular region, and we get a lot of people from the north half of Ireland. And the reason being is because historically the boats used to come over and uh, land in this particular region from the north part of Ireland. So it's sort of like a generational thing where they just kept replenishing, replenishing. And what I've noticed about the Irish communities, it really depends on where you came from and how you came. So, for example, if you came over to study um, an MA in UPenn, for example, um, it, it's more likely that you'd be much more assimilated in the sense that you would probably meet an American, you might get married to an American, and then you kind of blend into American society. Those that come over that are maybe undocumented or don't have the same level of skills um, as those who would have come over to study, tend to stay together with the Irish community. And I would say that that's probably the same for like a lot of communities like across the board. It's a safety net. And it's somebody you can connect it, they can, they can help you get jobs, there are levels of support. We provide a lot of those things for people. And, and those people, 
if I were to say, they probably stay the most true to their Irish roots and cultures. And um, often when I when I'm sort of dealing with citizenship or passports for um, Irish people who are of the professional um, the capacity, they tend to sound more American. They tend to be more American in their ways. And I think that's just a, a natural progression. It's not something that they do consciously, but it, it's something that just happens because of their environment. So they're working with Americans, they're, they're picking up the slang, they're, they're doing the American things, they're getting involved in American sports. Whereas if, if, if you're like um, an Irish person who, who works in certain types of profession with a lot of other Irish people, you're going to still talk the same way as they do. You're, you're probably more inclined to, to, to go for Irish food. You, you might even meet an Irish partner, and hence that sort of continues. And, and really, that really continues probably until the next generation. And you even actually find with some of their children that they're actually still quite Irish, but they have American accents. And often they end up marrying an Irish person, which I, I found even more fascinating. And so that, that's what I could say about the Irish community. And, but in, in terms of this sort of the cultural rich tapestry or, 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 or patchwork quilt that you could say is American society, I think it's, it's something wonderful and something to be celebrated. And I think it's fantastic that you can walk around the city and you can see different cultures. You can almost visit the whole world in a city. You can visit a Chinatown, you, you, you can visit a, a Latino and culture, and, and that's something to be celebrated. And uh, I think that that's probably going to continue um, as long as there are waves of immigrants to America. And I lived in Brazil for, for four years, and what I noticed about Brazil was that Everyone was kind of Brazilian, so I mean, it wouldn't really matter if you're from, like, say, the Lebanon or you're from Japan. You're actually just Brazilian, and you have like, you like, you'd be called like Pedro or you know uh, Miguel or something, and you know, essentially, you'd act and behave the same way as other Brazilians. Whereas I here, there still seems to be more sort of cultural pockets of, of different identities. And I think that's because the immigration continues, whereas in Brazil that's kind of stopped really since the 50s. And so, yeah, that, that, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much, Nina. Fascinating. All right, what we'd like to do now is turn this over to you. We really wanted this to be an interactive event. So we're looking for any stories and comments and experiences. And so any questions from any of the panel members at all? So you all would be really great this sounds up. Excellent. I've always had a problem with being turned off the top. Okay. I've always had a problem with being turned off the top. And I have to speak for the weekend. I'm three years old, but my parents moved to Brooklyn, so I was raised in Brooklyn. And we moved to Philadelphia in the 60s. And I always was aware of what was going on around me. And I always felt that there was a certain subtle message that you had to become American, that you had to act a certain way, that you had to speak a certain way. This is in my early years. And somewhere along the way, I rejected that. I just thought, no, I'm going to stay with my own accent, whatever it may be, and I'm going to value and I'm going to show this bad, and, and continue speaking Spanish when I want to, be Puerto Rican and be who I am and evolve and I'm very conscious of the things that I chose from the American culture. That said, I consider myself American, very much so. I also consider myself Puerto Rican. So, and I don't like the accented, the hyphenation Puerto Rican American because I don't think it exists. It's just a misnomer because Puerto Ricans are US citizens. So that's why I can feel free in whatever environment, in whichever environment, to choose to identify Puerto Rican or American, or just be. And I think at the end of the day, that's what we should all do. And also, I want to say one more thing. A lot of times, as we, um, the more people are educated and the more consciousness they have about their culture and, where they, and how they fit in into mainstream 
USA slash Philadelphia in this case. They pick and choose certain things and they retain certain things that they value. And to me, I think that is really the beauty of being my culture. <coughs> That's what I want to say. Maybe interesting comments. Uh, that's smoking. Right? <laughs> I'm sure there are people here who've taken the mega part of the, yeah, the mega part of the New York, which is, I'm also from Brooklyn, so <laughs> And my wife and I are always struck by the young people who line up in the mega bus now. Black, white, Asian, all completely different because we reflect on the world we grew up with. There was a mega bus in northern New Jersey in the 1950s. 98% of the people would have been white, mostly men probably, and an occasional black. But you young people live in a completely different world, which I hope you will cherish and expand on because I can't believe that it's anything but wonderful for this country and where we'll be going in the future. Observation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, just as a point of reference, our best projected figures, our best demographic figures suggest that by 2050, whites will not make up the majority of the population. By 2050, minorities, all the different groups, will make up a bigger percentage of the population. So, we're definitely moving in that direction, and I think that is to be cherished. As you said, well, for some people that things as a big threat, a big worry. And that might be another thing that we can think about tonight. I don't know about it. Um, I wonder just how much we are moving in that direction because I heard an interpretation from Dan Savage recently on this podcast that the whole notion of, like, for example, I'd say blue states are silly. Instead, you have cities where there's density and very different sorts of people are required to be around each other because they're going to go shopping together. You have no choice. You need to respect those rights because you are going to be around each other no matter what. And then less sense areas we don't need to care about an individual's differences or respect their rights as much according to people, you know? So I wonder if anyone has thought about that, talks about that, and if this is a discussion that the issue of cities and density and forced contact with the other. I experienced it myself living in Korea as a teacher when I was the other. And that was an interesting experience for me to be from Philadelphia. Okay, well, um, one thing I can say about that, and I know a lot about, is that Philadelphia is the sixth most segregated city in the United States. So, we do live together, but the other. Our children go to completely different schools. There are hyper segregated schools in Philadelphia where 98% of the children are black like and Latino and there are no white children in that school. We go to different churches, mosques, we go to different synagogues, we even work in different areas. So maybe, maybe we've got some work to do. Maybe we need to think about those issues as well. We're not really, and a lot of, I agree, this idea of the melting pot, we're not even in the same pot most of the time. So maybe that's another thing to think about. Okay, next comment. Um, well, first I want to thank everybody for sharing their perspectives. Um, and I, I actually had a question for everyone because uh, those of us in the LGBT community have been having a serious discussion for a very long while over the limits of assimilation versus retaining our queer identities. And I imagine that those similar conversations take place in immigrant communities. And, uh, you know, especially with marriage equality, we've come to this kind of there's, there's, there's those of us in our community that consider it aping heterosexuality, and that it's, it's destroying the LGBT identity, um, equality. The, the more that we become assimilated into American culture, the more we're actually losing our own unique identities and defaulting to what an oppressive society defaults to, which is straight white. Um, and so I'm kind of wondering uh, how each of you deal with this idea of like, what are the limits of assimilation versus retaining your innate identity? That's a really important question. I want to make two observations. Um, one is for immigrants to to thrive. And to thrive at a point of sustaining, even to adapt 
and to retain some of their own identity so that we can boss, uh, they need to have institutions. Lack of institutions is very difficult to achieve that. Uh, I know there are Catholics in the audience. I'm a Catholic, I'm a Catholic, I'm a Catholic, I've been baptized, used to be an altar boy. <laughs> I have a strong criticism of the Catholic Church, especially for often. I know friends of mine who are second generation Greeks and third generation Greeks who speak Greek. I say, when you learn it, I learned at the Greek Orthodox Church every Sunday. You know, the one in church, they had classes for Greek, teaching Greek at school for the kids. The Catholic Church in Philadelphia wasn't to think about abortion, wasn't to hate people who are gay, wasn't to own those things. And only the rebellious priests are engaged in immigration reform. And the Catholic Church is not paying attention to largest more in the second, which is the Latino population, but often is keeping a lot of the churches open. And, and that's a, you know, it's a really shame. And then, I remember, you know, it's too timid to raise the issue with the church parity. This, those conversations don't happen. Uh, so in that context, to have institutions that are strong, like the church, that can assist you, it's easy for you to begin to think that assimilation is your only salvation. And you know, you meet countless people who are second generation immigrants who <coughs> their grandparents used to speak the native tongue, and they keep lamenting, I wish I had learned language, because true language is human taking culture and identity. I think it's going to be a greater push for assimilation in the next few years if the agenda that we see being displayed is implemented. I think it's going to be a push to defy the projected demographics to make the country not more diverse by 2050, but to keep some second of white majority. So you can you know, attach yourself to some semblance of power, whatever that is. And I think that what happened to many Brazilians in Philadelphia, we had a huge migration of Brazilians in Philadelphia and in both sides of the rivers. And they began to enact stupid laws like in Bridgestone and here across the river in New Jersey that, you know, if you, if you were not a uh, green car, you cannot, you cannot run to the farm or something like that. They all left. They went back to the store. They educated the rest of it. They said, I don't need this. I go to a place of peace who I am. You know, you know, you know, you know, I need to take this. So, how strong the communities are to resist those wave of attacks when there's only whether or not we integrate in, in, in the meters you know, don't have projections, or well, then those remain being forced to be assimilated into a larger culture and to negate and then to reject everything that talks about who they are. Uh, and you cannot escape your identity, even if you think it's. I, I, you know, I've been told for the age of the United States, and I, say, and I, I used to meet upper class Nicaraguans who could not understand in my hand why this white person. Was discriminated against. They, they say, well, I'm white. I say, no, you're not white. And I say, you're not white. Don't understand this. You might be white than you are, but you're not, you're not white. <laughs> <laughs> and you speak English with an accent that makes you even worse. So, but I have five servants in my house and they're out. It doesn't count. It's a new reality. You have to understand that this is a different reality. And you, you have to understand all of that if you're an immigrant. In order for you to be able to kind of deal with the stuff that you see openly, the stuff that you don't see that's subconsciously driven to you by the society. Um, I just wanted to add a couple more uh, comments about that. Um, when my family first moved um, to Blacksburg, Virginia, uh, which I, I still see as, as my hometown, I, I still I love it. Um, it was a different time in my family movie. Um, I tried so hard to assimilate. I tried so hard. Um, I tried to rid myself of an accent. Um, I tried to straighten my hair out every day. Um, which, I mean, took two hours. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to dress like all the other kids at my school. I, I didn't really want to stand out. Um, I dressed very differently. Um, and I did ask my mom to figure out a way to make me look 
less less obvious. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, she she wanted me to be happy, so uh, she said, "Sure, sweetheart. Like, let's let's do what you you want to do." Um, and then, as I got older, I decided that I didn't really feel happy with the way I, I was um, <coughs> acting. Um, I really I had a uh, somewhat of an identity crisis, and I, I thought, why am I doing this to myself? Um, this is not me. And looking in the mirror, this is, this is not me. Um, there was always this, this lingering. Um, Later, I, get, I kind of suppressed my identity that needed to get out. Um, and at some point, I decided you can never, you can never get rid of who you are, right? Um, I will always be who I am, and, and if, if I cannot act um, in a manner that that shows who I am, then I will forever be suppressing this identity and um, oppressing my own self. Um, which would, could manifest in a whole slew of different uh, uh, psychological um, uh, manifestations. So, um, but as a result, I'm I'm a lot happier. Um, you know, you take you take the good and you leave the bad. Um, you don't need to completely transform yourself. Um, you can you can have different different ingredients of salad, right? Um, and that that's the way I've decided to live my life. Um, and that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Thank you. And to add to that, and I do feel that you have to, it's a natural progression that you do need to assimilate somewhat to the culture. And we have to remember that we are actually, we live here, but we're still guests. We, we weren't born there. And we didn't grow up through the ranks, so to some degree you're going to have to pay your dues. And, and I, I can say that with experience, having lived in different countries and having to adapt myself to the different cultures. There, there's not going to be everything that you like, but you have to accept that that's the way it is. And it's to some degree, you know, obviously there's certain things that, you know, are, are wrong. And, but for example, you know, Faye spoke about language earlier and, and, and how, you know, sometimes I, I have to hold myself back and I would say things uh, and people are like, what? Like, what are you talking about? And I'm sure we can have a conversation right now that nobody would understand. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I have an extra layer, and my husband being Brazilian with the accent, and I, I, I have to be conscious of saying candy, cookies, you know, trash. And, and, as we said, like, I want to put the rubbish out, people will get totally confused. So you have to somewhat adapt, and you're all, there's, there's always going to be, where you were born and where you were raised, it, it forms part of your character, it forms part of who you are. And, but as you move away from that, you move to another country, you change, and, and life is about change, and I guess it's the same with your community as well. So, you know, from back in the 60s, when you were fighting for the rights, and you've moved on from that. You're at a different stage now. There's gay marriage, you know, there's people with gay couples with families, you know, so it, it, it is a very, very different um, time, and, and, and the same goes for immigration. And the initial stages will always be the most difficult, but as time goes by, you know, if you were to go back to Saudi Arabia now, you probably would really fit in because you, you've changed as a person and evolved. And, and in fact, the country has changed as well. So I think that, that time changes everything and the simulation progress will do that. But there's nothing that can stop that. And, and that sort of goes back to Brazil where it probably is more of like a melting pot than here because if the immigration goes back so far at this point and um, with everyone's Brazilian, whereas it's here is you know, you're still getting those waves. So I actually ended up with I wanted to go back to the accent. Um, I do have a strong accent when I'm on the phone with my mother. Um, and if I could call her right now, uh, uh, she she would probably uh, bring that out again. Uh, what I've actually ended up with though is actually two accents. Um, when I am speaking uh, 
their way to my grandmother. Um, she will um, kind of sense um, an American accent, but uh, also when I'm speaking English, my mother on the phone, I will have an Arabic accent. So um, <coughs> I guess different environments bring out different uh, different versions of uh, a language. And they have to go to the back. There's a man here who is desperate to see. <laughs> so, how do you want to go back to see?
there are more Americans than another person when this is an adolescent country. And so we're still working on that. So let's never think that assimilation, what are you assimilating to? You're just assimilating to a concept. There's nothing to assimilate to. Stay who you are, and you're going to, just by your own existence, you're going to create the identity of the country.
that for me it's kind of uncomfortable being Catholic because it's so politically correct right now for everybody to hate us. Um, and it's based off of this betrayal of power and religion from the media. And if you actually study our religion, we just want to love people, but it's really, really trendy to say mean things about us. Um, so, just with any religion and any people backgrounds, please just try to be respectful and really like study it and know what you're talking about before you bad mouth it in public all the time because it just is kind of hurtful. Um, so, didn't mean to cry, I wanted to sound informed and smart like everybody else, but just with this whole beautiful culture that we have, it's such a blessing, um, and it's so common in history to jump on a bandwagon and just trash talk people because it's trendy, but just not like with hate in particular. It's really um, contagious. Um, so just know like there's so much beauty and there's so much good in the world, and when you hear somebody or a group of people, even if you respect them, Speaking poorly about something, really just take it on your own to just try to study that and learn before you just kind of jump on board. So that's all. Thank you. My question is for the panel. Um, with the current political situation, do you see a possibility of a like? ethnic or viable in this, this country? And if so, um, will that be dangerous or a problem? <coughs> well, it's, it's an opportunity. Of late, I mean, the last and long-term immigrants have green cards, you know, for God's sake, become a citizen now. You really wait for and I think we should push a lot of that. If you qualify at this point, you have five years of your done with green card, you become a US citizen, it's another belt of security around you for whatever it's all going to happen. But the other thing that it does, it allows you to participate more fully in the system. You can now vote and get elected as well. That's one thing. Throw out the county we have. 42,000 Asians who became U.S. citizens, 14,000 Latinos. There are 95,000 people in Philadelphia County who are green card owners. Most of them have more than five years minimum required to become a U.S. citizen. Why are they not citizen yet? It has to do with a quantity question that we raised in the day. Do I lose my identity if I become a U.S. citizen? What does that mean? I don't know the process. I think we collectively have a responsibility to raise the issue all the time. And, you know, last April was a push for Colombia to try to assist as many people as possible to become a citizen on time so we can raise it to vote and vote in the November elections. We we're always able to have 123 people because it's, it's a tedious process, it's labor intensive. We don't have enough pro bono lawyers to help us do that. Uh, but I think we have a responsibility to keep raising on every opportunity and do it. And the other thing is that immigrants community have their own organizations. You know, the Irish Center is here, the Salvatian organization, the Russian organizations in the Northeast, the, the uh, Caribbean organization, there are African organizations out of the uh, There is a group of what I call United Voices, which is a group that groups all the immigrant groups in the city. And they had done tremendous work. They did tremendous work last year around the, the, the mayor elections and the election courts, uh, the state Supreme Court justices. They held forums. And, and, and they drew hundreds and hundreds of people to these two events where you have communities from Southeast Asia, from Asia, from Africa, from Europe, who are immigrants, Arabs, and so on, and the Latinos, and call it this political activities for civic education. Uh, and those groups are looking for allies in the Russian community. And just, I hear your, 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 I hear your pain and, and I understand it because I've been in the receiving end in terms of my religious beliefs and the 
There's one thing to understand the politics of the institutions versus the people who practice the beliefs. And there's a huge separation between the two. Uh, we are in the, in the business of inclusivity. And that's, I have practiced inclusivity all my life. As an organizer, as a political activist, I am for winning the hearts and minds of people. But I think we should have difficult conversations. We should have this conversation all the time. You have no idea how many times I show up on a minute. I, I was a national vice president for an organization that had 4 million people national out of DC. And I used to go to meetings, get my name, get my name, for example, and say, if somebody would come up to me and say, oh yeah, we have this group of Latinos over here. I'm not here about Latinos, I'm representing them doing something else. You know, and then you have to, the polite thing to do is to smile, say nothing, but then you leave that person with that misconception about that you pitch your ball to do one thing only. <coughs> and if you understand the situation, you have no obligation to challenge it. You don't have to be nasty about it. You can challenge beliefs and notions in a polite way because eventually you want to win that person over to your side. And the only way to do that, and I know so many looking groups in the city, I'm telling you, they're not whites. They want to try one thing, you know, you have to understand where you are and you know, what is it you want to do? You want to win people to your side? There's a way to do that. And the way to do that, rational explanation, in a civic way, engaging people, listening to what people's concerns are. And then they give you an opportunity for you to explain yourself, explain who you are, explain what you want to do, explain what you want to be. Because most of the fear comes from this notion that you are challenging the status, you're taking away something, you deny them some specific rights and ability to survive. And without that. Involvement and um, identity. Um, so, when my family first moved, um, there was a really big um, identity uh, perception. So, uh, the way my parents saw it, they saw us as expats. We're only here temporarily. Um, obviously, I'm 28 now. I moved when I was 12. I've, I've been here a while. Um, I don't need, I, you don't need to do the math to figure it out. Um, but that's, that's the way my parents thought. Um, did, it, did it happen consciously? Did it happen subconsciously? Um, I feel like I, I've taken on um, a, a kind of transformed identity bias um, into kind of a, a mixture between both cultures. Um, and as far as political activism goes, or civic engagement, um, I think that People should definitely be involved. Um, I don't think people have to be citizens to be involved. I think there's uh, there's nothing more American than being civically engaged, um, having your voice heard. Um, I still have uh, about two more years until I can actually vote. Um, I went out and I canvassed before the election. Um, I felt like I, I needed to, um, and, and I thought that everyone else that had had a stake in the election, whether they can vote or not. Um, should absolutely be involved. Um, just because someone cannot vote does not mean that they cannot encourage other people to make the right decision. Um, so I, I absolutely think that people should definitely be involved. Um, it doesn't have to be um, a kind of a, a, a violent or fearful type of involvement. I think um, a peaceful type of civic engagement can really um, uh, open the floor uh, for people to just listen to each other. I think the biggest problem, uh, people disagree with each other because they don't really, or people are fearful of talking to each other because they, um, they're, they're worried that there's, there's something that they might lose. Um, so I think if people can be on neutral ground um, and just be really honest um, and open with each other, I think that's when there will be more understanding. We actually run a free legal clinic, and that that's not just for Irish people. We open it up to all nationalities. So I'm that. I'm that. 